I appreciate a lot finding the time to meet me. I think it's going to be super interesting to learn your perspective on, well, your journey with GPT-3 as a founder of Flowrite. Maybe it would be good if you yourself gave a little bit of a short background about yourself, like, you know, where, where do you come from in all this? Yeah. Absolutely. So um, we started Fluoride in August, September last year. Prior to Fluoride, I worked at a startup accelerator here in Finland. So uh, we're based in Helsinki. I used to run an accelerator program called QS, which is kind of the leading accelerator incubator here in Finland. And I was there for a couple of years. And uh, prior to that, I spent some time in the Finnish startup ecosystem. So I worked at Slush as well which is the uh, startup and tech event. So I was there for a while and uh, Q was then kind of my main project and kind of my number one learning experience to the startup scene and how startups are being built. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of find this moment in your memory where you decided to set out to actually build the platform with your co-founder? Yeah, um, me and Carlos, who's uh, my co-founder, we kind of reconnected uh, last summer, already earlier during the summer. We had met about three years back already. We kind of teamed up and started thinking about different ideas, different markets to tap into. And we were both quite excited about productivity and, and also writing tools. So we have been using all kinds of different productivity tools. We were both avid writers. so. We kind of knew how much time we're both spending on writing every day. So the problem was quite apparent. And we were also kind of following the space of NLP and, and uh, open AI and these language models. And we ended up applying for the beta to GPT-3 and kind of came up with the idea for Flowrite. The first thing was that you wanted to build a productivity tool or the first thing was that you were excited about GPT-3 and kind of uh, started to ideate <laughs> yeah. at the top? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the main thing was that we just wanted to build a product together uh, with Carlos. Mm -hmm. uh, productivity space was one of the ones that we were most excited about and uh, wasn't immediately when GPT-3 was launched, which was in June um, last yeah. year, it wasn't like immediately that we decided to tap into that. So we were still kind of thinking about different things. We kept following uh, the development that had been happening in GPT-3. So there were a lot of like exciting products and demos published with it throughout the summer. And then we kind of just came up with the idea, with the combination of the problem being very apparent to us both, and then kind of seeing the capabilities of GPT-3 and the, especially the generative side of it. Yeah, connected to that, I wanted to ask you just to clarify also for people that come across Chloride for the very first time, what is guys your main mission and where are you going in terms of your vision for the product? Sure, um, great question. So I guess the overall mission is that we want to help people be more productive in their daily writing. So I guess one of the founding fundamentals behind Chloride was that we had been spending so much time on writing every day, especially the kind of repetitive writing that you do, emails, messages. Um, for some other people, it might be social media posts and content, but especially for us, it was kind of communicative purposes. We felt that a lot of this exchange could be automized since it's repetitive. So we want to help people be more productive in their daily work. What would you say was the biggest challenge so far for you when you set out to use this particular API to fuel your product? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it comes down to the kind of product and the type of product that we're trying to build, which is something that becomes a very integral part of your daily workflow. So it's not something that you just use like once a month or once a week um, just to impress or just to kind of have something to play around with. But we're actually trying to build it so that you use it multiple times a day, like 10, 10 20, 30 times a day, which I'm doing and many of the people in the beta are doing. Um, and that requires a very deep understanding of the models GPT-3 that we're using and making sure that we have the best type of prompt to get to the most accurate results on the first or hopefully the second or third try. So since we're working this extension format, we're not necessarily wanting to give the user like 10 different type of generations to choose from, but we want to 
hit the nail on the head on the very first try. So that means that we need to be kind of very accurate to the context. We need to understand who the user is and what type of things they typically write. And uh, one of the ways we do that is introducing these templates where users can kind of specify how they want to write, what's the intention with the emails that they generate, and also kind of describing the recipient. And these are the ways we guide GPD-3 to the right context. So the main challenge was to actually create this sort of context understandable for GPT-3 to hit the right response whenever you know it's being asked for it yeah i guess like making it uh as consistent as possible so mm -hmm. it's not that you get like a good result on on one of the the 10 uh generations but you get uh like really high accuracy when you generate the fluoride Okay, I wanted to ask you about this list of people signed up for the product. I know that you made a not typical decision to hold your horses and slowly onboard one-on-one -on -one users on the platform. I personally had a call with your customer support team member, Ava, which was great. And you really pay attention to these one-on-one -on -one interactions with the users. And so the process of onboarding them is much slower. While, as we know, there's like thousands of people sort of waiting to get an idea of how your product is working. Where does it come from? And how do you find it so far, this decision? Is it a good one? <laughs> yeah, um, so far it's been great. Um, so from those onboardings, there are kind of like two main purposes. The first one is to make sure that the users get started with the product in the best possible way. So they don't just kind of land on the app and the extension and don't know how to use it. Um, so, so making sure that they actually know how to prompt it or instruct Fluorite and create their templates. And I guess the second reason why we do those is kind of an internal reason. So we also are able to learn a lot from those onboarding calls. We're seeing how people perceive the product, how they think about it, if there is any kind of glitches in the ux or any bugs that might come across during the calls it's really a good way to just identify them as soon as possible mm -hmm. uh, or as soon as they happen and um, overall a goal with the onboardings is that since we have this huge wait list and we're definitely not going to do these onboarding calls forever like for the entire wait list of, of 15 uh, 20 000 people or so uh, but we want to kind of maximize the engagement or how good the product is once we onboard or like invite all of these people so if we were to just invite all of these people on the wait list when we first time had the the possibility to do that which was a few months ago then i guess the churn would have probably been like much higher than it is now and what it will be in a couple of months down the line when we've kind of made the product experience even better and built this self-serve way of getting onboarded. So that's what we're kind of trying to maximize here. Would you say it's a different philosophy to move fast and break things? You know, the one that has been around in the startup community for a while. Like I know that, for example, all the incubators, all the VCs are just like pushing startups to create an MVP, throw it out there, and then based on the user feedback kind of improve, but let it, you know, run in the wild. Whereas yeah. I think what you're doing is more like creating this closed beta and thinking about it as your laboratory so that you can closely yeah. observe and then actually release the proper version. Yeah, but to be honest, like that's kind of what we did as well. So uh, mm -hmm. the first version that we released was definitely not ready. It was an MVP and we definitely weren't like comfortable with it. We knew that there's a lot of things that we want to fix. And by having the first users use the product, we were able to identify how serious some of those fixes are and what's the kind of prioritization of things that we want to develop. But I think that we can get the same quality and value out of the feedback by having, you know, a few hundred of users than we would be able to get with like uh, 15,000 or, or, or tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So I would rather just kind of have a smaller beta to start with and then, you know, we can still collect feedback from them. And, and then launch it for the public once we feel comfortable with it. I wanted to also ask you about the product roadmap, if you can share some insight into it, because I'm very curious 
For example, right now I know I'm able to use the extension in uh, Gmail. I am also able to use it in your platform and also kind of customize the templates, etc. How do you envision the progress on the roadmap to five years from now? Yeah. Um two or five years might be difficult to estimate, but I guess in the kind of more shorter term roadmap, we're, we're wanting to make the email communicative experience really stellar. Currently we're integrated to Gmail, but we have a lot of different kind of integrations on the roadmap and also mm -hmm. building more of a horizontal version that you can use across the web and then making that really stellar without having to rush into new things before we can really make what we have already an amazing experience but i guess like the natural extension to this is to include other types of writing not just kind of email and, and short form writing but maybe also like a longer form or content writing social media and these kinds of things we also kind of have mentioned them on the website and when we were just starting out we we already played around with those kinds of prompts and have generated those kinds of things and have the back end built for those, but have decided to just focus for now. So down the road, is it going to be somewhat similar situation to what Grammarly does, for example, that you have an extension and you are able to use it with many different tools, many different platforms, and basically wherever you write a text, it is able to correct your grammar, etc. Of course, Floret is generating text, so it's like one step further, but do you envision something like this, that it's kind of integrated into everything you do every day online? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of uh, what we've had in mind from the very first day, I guess, when we started. We were really inspired the way that you're able to use Grammarly across the web on all of those websites and platforms where you are writing on a daily basis. But I guess for now, we just kind of wanted to start with Gmail. We know that a very high percentage of the people that have joined our waitlist are Gmail users and they're Chrome users. So just wanted to kind of nail that first and then move into a more horizontal. Awesome. I know that you gained also quite some interest from the VC world uh, when you launched the initial version of the product. And the many people on the waiting list are actually VCs, like people that are just excited to potentially help you out also with building the business. You also had an experience of working at an accelerator before. So you know the kind of, especially European VC landscape, I can imagine quite well. Would you say there are any differences in terms of this conversation between a startup and a VC when GPT-3 is the main engine behind the product? To be honest, like this is my first startup. Um, it's difficult to compare those discussions between what we're doing now and if we were not using GPT-3. But I guess it's something that investors are curious about, like how we utilize the model and how we see the future of it. Did you find it easy to communicate what the GPT-3 is about? Did you find this level of understanding with them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially now, almost every single investor knows what GPT-3 is and have seen products built with it so they kind of know what it's all about. Mm -hmm. They probably don't know like how it works technically, like how do you prompt it and how mm -hmm. it works in, in that way, but that's something that we can always explain. Do they have any concerns related specifically to it? For example, like the business model of OpenAI that it's still uh, you know, in the discovery phase, let's say. So are they somewhat concerned or are they asking you questions, for example, if you're thinking about it, if you're taking this into account when thinking about uh, scaling? Yeah, it depends on the investor. I think most investors have now kind of understood that it's not just about using the API, not just about like, you know, building a product on top of GPT-3, but you need to have a lot of things in place in addition to that and need to have your set of own technology as well to make the experience really stellar for the user. So I guess those those investors who understand it are not necessarily that worried about uh, the dependency on GPT-3. And they also seem to kind of understand that the landscape is evolving a lot and mm -hmm. GPT-3 probably won't be the only model in a few years down the line. And there's going to be like a lot of language models, either from OpenAI or, or some other folks that we can utilize. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. That's uh, That's great to hear, actually.
coming back to fluorite honestly i'm a huge fan of your ux i love the simplicity of it i think it's super sure. like cute and also it's not overwhelming in terms of features i know that you're very early on on this path but it's like simple clean very friendly is there any particular philosophy that you were using when designing how did it end up so nice <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question, and I probably should be able to answer that because I've been doing the design myself. I guess it's been quite natural. I haven't like done a lot of planning on the design. It's been like very straightforward. I guess the underlying thought behind it is that we wanted to make a kind of an inclusive design. I guess something very simple and something that doesn't like trigger opinions let's say so like if we were to have something that has like super strong elements and like um, a lot of colors like these kinds of things um you know some users might agree with it but then some users might not we wanted to build kind of a product that looks friendly and approachable to as many people as possible because again we're trying to build something that becomes the very core part of how you work so then people need to be comfortable with it and they don't want to see something ugly like 10, 20, 30 times a day when they, they either, they're using fluoride. Yeah, absolutely. I think it makes a big impact and it can either make or break a product if the UX is nice and you want to come back to it. And especially yeah. in your case, I haven't even thought of that honestly, but now I totally get your point that since it's going to be like assisting the user throughout their day i guess it's best if it's kind of neutral and nice so you mentioned that this is your first startup and i think there are some people in the audience of the channel that are also thinking perhaps about starting their own business and perhaps also using gpt3 as the magic behind it so would you have any advice for somebody that is thinking about doing something yeah absolutely there's i guess the basic advice of really building something that people fall in love with and building something that you want to use yourself. But I guess like those are the things that people already know. Something that we've been quite focused on fluoride is when we launched initially and when we'd be doing these like smaller and bigger launches afterwards is that we put in a lot of focus on those and like a lot of time on preparing these. I think it's been quite helpful and we've been getting really good results of many of these announcements that we've made for example the very first announcement that we made which was in october when we released the um the website and told everybody about what we're working on that became like a really successful we had a lot of engagement to all of the social media posts that we did and that has been like so helpful in so many ways so you know for potential hires it's really great that they can see that there's a lot of interest towards what we're building we had a lot of people joining the wait list already during the first day that we launched even though we didn't have any product ready at that point and also a lot of inbound coming from investors and we raised the pre-seed round following that so I guess the the kind of common advice is that you know just launch and 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 don't spend too much time on it because nobody will remember your launch in a few years down the line but i guess like uh for us it's been um really helpful to actually spend a little bit more time on preparing these and making the launches really rememberable rememberable <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly okay awesome thank you so much What's the next big milestone for Flowrite? Where are you guys heading now? Yeah, I guess the the uh, one of the bigger announcements coming uh, during the next months or so is the kind of public release. So we're <laughs> giving away the, the wait list or just you know, not having a wait list anymore. We're just releasing the product for the public. Let's see when that's going to happen. That That's something that we're working on. I'm super excited for it. I keep my fingers crossed for your journey. And uh, thanks so much for talking to me and uh, yeah, finding time to just shed some light on your story. Absolutely. Thanks, Sandra. Really enjoyed it. Me too. Thanks a lot. Uh, and have a great day. Yeah, you too.